Hello and welcome to this Revision Monkey video on what's going to be in the 2022 exams. So this video is for the AQA specification and is for combined scientists and the version of combined science is trilogy and that means that they do six papers at the end of your year 11. Each paper is one hour and 15 minutes long and this video is for physics paper one foundation so do check with the teacher to make sure you're watching the right video. I'll put a link in the description to a video that focuses in particular on the required practicals and I'll also hopefully put a link in there for some practice questions as well so do keep an eye out for those in the description. First of all let's discuss what's not going to be assessed in the paper. So the topics they've told us that won't come up are Domestic uses and safety, so that's in the electricity topic. Particle model and pressure. And atoms and isotopes. So those three topics are not going to be assessed in this year's paper. They've also told us the required practicals that will be assessed. And those are specific heat capacity and current potential difference graphs or IV graphs as they're otherwise known. So do look out in the description, I'll put a link in there for those required practicals to focus on. And this video is going to focus on the following topics which we've been told are the major focus of the exam. And those are energy changes in the system and the ways energy is stored before and after such changes national and global energy resources, current potential difference and resistance, changes of state and the particle model, and atoms and nuclear radiation. One of the most important things to do with energy is that energy can't be created, it can't be destroyed, it can only be moved from one place to another. It's one of the basic rules of the universe. Now, um, in this energy stores and systems topic, they might use the word system. A uh, system is really just a thing or things you're looking at. So, for example, a system could be a ball falling or a, a can full of gas. Okay, a closed system just means one where no energy or matter can enter or leave the system. Um, energy is only transferred between these stores. So these are stores of energy where energy can be held in it or it can be moved between these. So thermal energy is like heat energy, kinetic energy, also known as movement energy, uh, gravitational potential energy, that's energy due to the height above the ground, elastic potential energy, the energy inside springs and elastic stretchy things, chemical energy, things like uh, petrol, f uh, foods, um, inside glucose, okay, magnetic energy, that of magnets, electrostatic, so that would be the uh, energy in um, electricity or stored in, a, in, a, in an electric field, nuclear energy, that energy inside an atom. Okay, so those are the uh, eight different types you need to know about and energy can transfer between those types. So energy can be transferred by heating or we can say that energy can be transferred by doing work. And when we talk about doing work, that means the same as the energy transferred. So we've got uh, a kettle is transferring heat energy, so there'll be some electrical energy arriving in the, in the wire. That electrical energy will be transferred into heat energy in the filament, and that heat energy will go into the water. So that's how energy can be transferred there. And the, the number of joules of energy, of electrical energy, will be transferred into the number of joules um, in, into, the, into the water. But also there'll be a little bit of sound as well that comes out as wasted energy. So here are some examples of how we can do work to transfer energy. Well, when we throw a ball upwards, there is chemical energy inside his arm, and that chemical energy inside his arm will go will be transferred into the kinetic energy of the ball as he throws it upwards. Uh, as the ball starts to fall back down again, gravitational potential energy inside the uh, inside the uh, in the ball will be transferred into kinetic energy as it as it falls. Uh, a speeding car, which is uh, is hot on the brakes there, as you can see with our um, you can see with our, uh, our the red glowing brake pads there. Well, when we look at that, we can see down here that that's glowing red because we're transferring kinetic energy into thermal energy that's inside the uh, inside the tires there. And when we crash a car, we're transferring the kinetic energy 
um, transferring that into into kinetic energy to make the crumple zones crumple. So that that moving metal as it as it crumples, that's tr that's changing the speed into transferring that energy into the uh, into the crumple zones um, into and down here. Okay, so conservation of power then. Um, conservation of power is the rate of doing work. So the rate of transferring energy, how quickly I'm, I'm using energy or, or, or transferring energy. So two equations for this, we've got um, power equals energy divided by time or power equals work divided by time. Remember that power and work, are, uh, sorry, work done and energy transferred are the same things. Okay, so our two equations then, look, they've even got the same units just to prove that they are the same thing. Okay, so there's something you need to know with, with power. You need to be able to describe how two machines with uh, the same machine rather with two different powers how it will do its job differently. Now we can say that both of these hair dryers will be able to do the same amount of work. They can both transfer the same amount of energy. They'll both heat uh, dry the hair up eventually. But one's got a higher power rating than the other. Uh, that'll be this lucky lady here. And uh, the one with a higher power rating is going to dry her hair more quickly. Uh, it's going to transfer the same amount of work to dry the, dry the hair, but it's going to do it more quickly because it's got a bigger power. And the reason for that is, is that we're dividing our energy transfer by time. So the shorter the time, the bigger the power. Okay, the shorter the time, the bigger the power. Okay, so kinetic energy and potential energy. So kinetic energy, we all know that that's movement energy. Well, there's an equation you need for that. So uh, kinetic energy, measured in joules, is equal to half or 0.5 times mass times velocity squared. Okay, so that's velocity times by velocity. Okay. Um, now, gravitational potential energy, so the energy due to the height above the ground, is potential energy equals mass times gravity times height. Now, the unit for these then are down here. We've got gravitational potential energy in joules. Mass measured in kilos, gravity field strength in newtons per kilo. You'll be given that in the exam. You don't need to recall that number. And the height as well. Okay, so for example, we've got someone jumping off of a cliff. Um, they have gravitational potential energy stored in them at the top because of their height up here. And this will transfer, as they fall, this will transfer into the kinetic energy. The further down they fall, the faster, the higher the kinetic energy until they land uh, very safely at the bottom there, I hope. Okay, so specific heat capacity. I've left this to the end of the topic because this is a part where um, we really want to try and focus to get a, just, a, just a few marks in a six mark question related to this. You don't, don't feel like you have to get um, the entire method correct, that you have to aim for six marks or nothing. So let's have a look at this, uh, this uh, required practical to see how we can, we can pull out marks on this. So definition of specific heat capacity. Um, well, it, the specific heat capacity of a material decides how much energy it takes to increase the temperature of a kilo of that material by one degree Celsius. So the equation for this is the energy required is found by the mass of that object, as we said the, um, the mass is involved, times by the specific heat capacity, uh, times by the change in temperature. Okay, and here are our units, so energy in joules, mass in kilos, Specific heat capacity, joules per kilogram degree Celsius. And this theta thing up here, that egg-shaped thing, is the temperature change okay, in degrees Celsius. Now, if we have a look at the practical here, well, what have we got here? This is a rough diagram showing us how we're going to uh, carry out a, uh, a practical to investigate the specific heat capacity of this block. So... This is a metal, and we want to find out how much energy does it take to increase that temperature uh, by one degree. So to do that, we've got our thermometer here, we've got our metal block on the inside, and we've insulated it. It's a really important idea that, that we put insulation around the outside, so that the heat we're putting into the block stays in the block and doesn't, doesn't come out and, uh, and warm up the room. We don't want that. So uh, what else have we got? We've got a power supply here, providing our electricity. This here is our heating element, so our electricity is going to be transferred into heat inside this um, metal block. Now up here we've got two things, we've got a voltmeter and we've got a nanometer, because they're going to help us to work out the power, the energy transferred. They're going to help us with this energy transferred bit over here. Okay, so let's have a look at this then. So these are our two pictures from the previous slide, and let's have a look at a potential method 
for how to find the specific heat capacity of a material. And again, don't feel like you need to get every single part of this to get six marks. If we're hitting two or three marks, we'll be doing really well on this type of question because it is a it is a nasty one. So how to find the specific heat capacity of a material. Firstly, weigh the block. We need to know from the equation, if you look at the equation closely, we need to know the mass. So measure the mass. Okay, We can all remember to do that. Insulate the block, wrap it up, take the starting temperature. If you think about finding this number here, our change in temperature, that's got to come with taking the starting and the final temperature. So easy marks so far. Weigh it, take the starting temperature, at the end take the final temperature. Okay, so we're going to turn on the heater, we're going to time how long the heater's on for. Now take the ammeter, that's going to give you the current, and the voltmeter, it's going to give you the voltage, and then use power equals current times voltage to calculate the power of the heater. Once we know the power of the heater, we can then use energy transferred equals power times time to calculate the energy transferred to the block. That will tell us over here, that will tell us our E, our energy transferred, leaving us to be able to rearrange this to find C. So take the final temperature, calculate the change in temperature theta, now rearrange the specific heat capacity equation to find C. So C equals E over M times theta. Like I said, don't feel like you have to get all marks there, but just think about how am I going to take some readings here to be able to work out the missing variables of the equation for me to find C. Okay, so energy resources and their uses. So energy resources fall into two categories, renewable and non-renewable. Non-renewable. So renewable means it won't run out, non-renewable will run out. And when we look at the renewables, these examples, you all know these really well, just a couple to maybe focus in on. Hydroelectric is falling water, that's a river going down a mountain. Uh, biofuels, well they're bio as in biology, living plants and animals, or dead plants and animals rather. Uh, for example, crops, tidal power, the tides coming in twice a day, geothermal, geo meaning rocks, earth, thermal meaning hot, so hot rocks under the ground. And f these, are, these are all free energy once you've set them up. They're not always reliable, these ones. Some of them depend on the weather, particularly wind power, particularly solar power. We may need lots of them to supply our energy needs. Okay, so non-renewable ones, coal, oil and gas, these ones will run out one day. And they damage the environment by producing carbon dioxide, which causes global warming. And they currently provide most of our energy needs. Okay, so they're really important to us, but they're bad for the environment. We've got to be super specific about that. They release CO2, which causes global warming. And there's another one which is non-renewable, would also run out, but not so quickly, in a few thousand years, that's nuclear energy, and where we have lots of energy from a small mass of fuel, you know, one kilo of uranium will, will power, a, will make a lot of electricity, and a small risk of disaster. So there's not much chance of it happening, but when it does happen, it's very bad. Um, for example, Chernobyl in, in the Ukraine. So there are no polluting gases from this, and we've got to be really clear about that. It doesn't produce carbon dioxide. We're not burning anything, so there's no need uh, to talk about carbon dioxide here. There are no polluting gases with nuclear. We can also use energy resources for transport and heating. So when we use them for, for transport, uh, biofuels are used more and more for vehicles. So biofuels, such as your crops being used to produce ethanol, they can be used more and more for vehicles. And we've also got using renewable power for heating, solar water heaters on people's roofs, burning biofuels, that could be just burning wood in a, in a fire fireplace, or a geothermal heat pump uh, to heat buildings. So that's hot rocks heating up the water under the ground. Now non-renewable as transport, non-renewable energy is used petrol and diesel are created from oil, which still provides most of our transport needs. So these two are our most common um, forms of, uh, of fuel used for, for motor vehicles. And non-renewable is heating, so, so how we heat our homes using non-renewable? Well, burning gas is the most common use. So gas boilers heat up water and pump it around our radiators. Coal is often burnt in fireplaces and electric heaters. They'll be plugged into the mains and so they use um, electricity from uh, non-renewable sources in the most part. OK, 
Okay, so trends in energy use then. Trends means like how things are the pattern of, of how our energy use is, is changing over the years. So we still depend on fossil fuels. Um, they are they used to to create electricity, and the demand for electricity has increased in the hundred in the last hundred years. But it is starting to slow down as we as we become more careful about how we use it. So we want to use more renewable resources. We want to use more uh, wind and solar and wave power. Burning fossil fuels releases carbon dioxide, which creates global warming. Um, things which are really really are our biggest threat probably to uh, to mankind at the moment. This increase of temperature threatens us with melting ice caps, rising sea levels, changing weather patterns, and governments have signed up to agreements to reduce the use of non-renewable resources. So there is the Paris Climate Agreement that all nations signed up to, um, to recently, I think it's 2016, and the US has recently decided to pull out of that, although uh, many people are hoping that they will rejoin that. So that's an agreement to reduce the use of, um, of fossil fuels in order to reduce the global warming, the effect of global warming. Using more renewable resources is limited because of how because of how reliable it is. So if we can't use lots of solar power in a place where it's not very sunny, um, we can't use a lot of wind power if it's never windy. So how expensive the research and the installation is, um, that is a limiting factor. Um, it reduces the amount of resources that we're, we're trying and the difficulty of international politics between countries. So as I was mentioning there, the US pulling out of the Paris uh, Climate Agreement. Okay, here we have some common uh, symbols. Now, uh, which ones are maybe the ones we might, might sometimes struggle to remember? Okay, so diode. The job of a diode is to only let electricity through in one direction. So that's why it's got a little arrow and it's being in a little flat line there. So in your circle is an arrow with a flat line that's telling us which direction it's going and it won't flow backwards again. Thermistor, just like, all, just like a resistor, but instead it's got a diagonal line, flat bit at the bottom, as if that's maybe like a, a heating um, graph or a, uh, the line of temperature going up there. LDR is another one you need to know. So LDR has got our little rectangular box, circle around it, and it's got our two little arrows coming in. Now if this is a light dependent resistor, what do we think those little arrows represent? They're the light going into it. Variable resistor, that's our, our arrow going through there to, to show that we can change that. Okay, so what are the circuit rules? We must have a closed loop. We must have a circuit that, that goes round in a, in a loop and it must include a source of potential difference. So having a look here at this, at this uh, basic circuit, we've got uh, current, which is one of the most important parts of electricity. Current is the flow of electrical charge. It's the flow of electrons. Current is slowed down by resistance. So anything that resists the flow of electricity, we call resistance. Now the bigger the resistance, the, uh, the bigger the resistance, the smaller the current. Because of course if something's resisting that current, the current's gonna get less. So current equals, sorry, charge, the flow of charge, equals current times time. Or another way of writing it, current equals the rate of flow of charge. So Q over T, how the charge is given out over time. Okay, charge is measured in coulombs, current is measured in amps, and time in seconds. Okay, so resistance then, how do we calculate resistance? Well, you need to be able to make a circuit to be able to, to measure resistance. So we can't measure it directly. So what we have to do is we have to use V equals I times R. So we can rearrange this to find R. We're going to have R equals V divided by I. Okay, so R equals V divided by I. And we need to place our ammeter in a specific place. The ammeter has to be in series with the circuit, so all in on the loop. And a voltmeter though, that's measuring the potential difference across the component. So we have to have our voltmeter in parallel. So you notice here the wires come off of the sides of the resistor that we're trying to work out the uh, resistance for. So to find the resistance of an unknown component, rearrange V equals IR to R equals V over I. And resistance measured in ohms. And current is measured in amps, voltage, potential difference is measured in, volt in volts. Okay, so LDRs and thermistors then, what do we need to know about these? Well, an LDR is a light-dependent resistor, 
So it's a resistor that depends on light. And it uh, is often used in um, street lighting. There's a little bobble at the top of it there. So that turns the light on and off when it's uh, dark or light. Now we have a, um, a, an actual LDR just here. Not that you need to know what they look like, but you do need to know the symbol for it. So there's our LDR, that's our light coming into our, sim into our component there. You also need to know the shape of the graph. So the shape of the graph is that increasing the light intensity, as that one goes up, that resistance goes down. So you need to know the shape of that graph, and thankfully thermistors have got the same shape of the graph. So as the resistance goes down, um, the uh, temperature goes up. Okay, and there is our thermistor, that's what they look like. Uh, this is the symbol for it. You don't need to know what they look like, but you do need to know the symbol. And you also need to know some examples of where they happen. So they, uh, they occur in kettles, so when it gets too hot, the kettle turns itself off, and in a thermostat as well. So, for example, when it gets too cold, your heating can, can come on. Um, the particle model. So uh, what do we know about the particles in a solid, in a liquid and in a gas? So what can we say about the energy of the particles? Well, as they go from solid to gas, so we can imagine this as maybe water. We've got our ice and we've got our normal water. We've got our, our, our steam up here. And check out my handwriting. Yes, it's like a toddler. So there is my steam. Okay, so we've got our ice all the way up to steam. Energy of the particle goes up as we go from solid to gas. The arrangement then, so here they are all touching. Liquids, they are partially touching. Gases, they are not touching. They're far apart from each other. What about the forces of attraction then? Well, solids, they have strong forces of attraction. That's why they are so close together. Gases, really weak forces of attraction. In fact, they've broken their forces of attraction. Um, that's why they're not touching each other. They're not connected. And the distance between the particles, that also goes up. And the shape of them, so these ones, or um, you know, will sit uh, at the bottom of a container. Liquids will fill the entirety of a bottom of a container, and gas will fill up the whole of a container. Density is basically how much mass is packed into a volume. The more mass you pack into a volume, the bigger that number is, the bigger the density. Okay, the smaller your volume, the smaller that is, the bigger the density. So you put mass into a smaller volume, you've got a bigger density, and that is rho. That's the unit, the symbol there for density. Rho equals mass divided by volume. Mass in kilograms, volume, meters cubed. Okay, giving us our density in kilogram per meters cubed. So we can calculate the we can calculate the volume of a regular object like a cuboid by doing width times length times height. Uh, we can find the uh, volume of a liquid really easily. We put it into a measuring cylinder, and one milliliter on our measuring cylinder is the same as one centimeter cubed. So that gives us our volume really easily. Now, if we want to take the, the find the density of a um, of an odd shaped object like a Lego man. So for each of these equations, whether whether we're doing the cuboid, a liquid, or the Lego man, um, we need to be weighing them on a set of set of scales first to find their mass. So we just basically need to find these things in the equation. So we can calculate our volume by doing width times length times height, or from a measuring cylinder, or by dipping our Lego man into our uh, Eureka can here, and when you put the Lego man into the water, uh, he will displace, he will shift an even volume of water, an equal volume of water to his volume. So out will come water, and we can collect that in a measuring cylinder, so that water goes into here, and that will tell us the, the volume. Okay, so isotopes and nuclear radiation then. Um, what do we know about our three types of radiation given out out of the nuclei of unstable atoms? We can get alpha radiation, beta radiation, gamma radiation. There, these are our Greek letters here. It's basically like a little A. There's like a, a capital B with a tail, and there's like a squirrely Y. Here are our symbols for them. Well, this tells us that alpha particles are a helium nucleus. It's exactly the same as a helium nucleus because it is a helium nucleus. It's made of two protons and two neutrons. 
our electron that comes out of a um, that comes out of the nucleus is a high energy electron, slightly different to the ones that go around the outside, but not much. And uh, that is literally just made of an um, an electron there. And our gamma radiation, that is our electromagnetic wave. Uh, now, they've got charges because they're electrically charged. This has got two protons in the middle, no electrons, so it's got a plus two charge. Our electron has a minus one charge, and our gamma radiation, because it's not a particle, doesn't have a charge. Now, they are all, each one of these is stopped by a different material. So alpha radiation, being the heaviest and the slowest travelling, is stopped by a thin piece of paper. Our beta radiation is stopped by a thin sheet of aluminium and our gamma radiation is stopped by a thick piece of lead. See, we can also see that reflected up here in our, ta in our table and we can also see the range that that travels in air. So alpha radiation travels just a few centimetres, beta radiation up to a metre, gamma radiation a really long way up to a kilometre. And they've got different ionising powers. Now ionising power is about stripping electrons, the power to strip electrons from atoms. And alpha radiation, because it's got a positive plus two charge, it is really highly ionizing. So that's very dangerous if you were to get it on the inside of you, as it would keep on stripping electrons from your DNA, and that could cause cancers. Uh, our, gamma ra our beta radiation is also ionizing, but not quite as much as alpha, alpha radiation, because we can see that that also has an, uh, an electrical charge but our gamma radiation doesn't have much ionising power, it's very low, but of course it's still dangerous because gamma radiation passes straight through us. Okay, they are alpha and beta particles are deflected by an electric field. Um, so they are, beta radiation will be attracted to a positive plate of an electric field because beta has a negative charge, it's going to go to the positive, they're attracted. And our alpha radiation because it's a positive charge, is going to be attracted to the negative plate. Gamma radiation has no charge, so it will pass straight through undeflected. Now, nuclear de decay equations, we can actually... That's the wind blowing my blinds over there, excuse that. So, nuclear decay equations, uh, alpha, beta and gamma radiation are all emitted by the nucleus. They all come out of the nucleus. Now, when an alpha particle comes out, because it's made of two protons and two neutrons, it's going to make my mass number go down by 4. It's going to make my atomic proton number go down by 2. Now, a beta particle, a beta particle, the mass number is going to stay the same. And the atomic proton number is going to go up by 1. And the reason for this is, is that when an, a beta particle comes out of the nucleus, a neutron is turning into a proton, and it releases that e electron. So when a neutron, which has a mass of 1, turns into a proton, which also has a mass of 1, the mass number stays the same. But because there's now a new proton, the atomic number or proton number goes up by one. Okay, gamma radiation is a high energy electromagnetic wave, so it has no effect on the mass number or the proton number. Now over here we've got some examples of nuclear decay equations. You will have to calculate the new mass number and the atomic number. That's the mass number and that is the uh, uh, atomic number. So we're going to have to calculate those two numbers. So let's see how we would do that. So if they told us that uranium-235-92 is going to decay by releasing an alpha particle, you've got to reduce the top number by 4 and reduce the atomic number by 2. Because as we can see over here that that number plus this number has to add up to that number. Okay, so we have to keep it balanced in that regard. So now we'll, let's have a look at a beta particle coming out. In a beta particle, as we say over here, let's clear all this off, as we say over here, in beta decay, mass number stays the same, atomic number goes up by 1. Mass number is 14, stays the same at 14, and atomic number goes up by 1. When it goes up by 1, it's no longer carbon, it's now nitrogen. Okay, so you just need to make sure that these numbers here, your 7 and your minus 1, balances to your 6. Over here, your 14 and your 0, balance to 14. And then when we release a gamma wave, there is no change to those mass numbers and, and, and uh, atomic numbers. They stay the same. Okay, so calculating half-life then. Uh, so half-life of a radioactive material, you can say it in two different ways. It's the time taken for the radioactive count rate to go down by half, 
or it's the time taken, another way of saying the same thing, the time taken for the number of radioactive, radioactive atoms to go down by half. So how to calculate half-life from a graph? So if it's the length of time, here we've got our time going along the bottom there, if it's the length of time, the length of time for the nuclei number to go down by half, what we have to do is look and see what is our starting number there. Well, that is 100 nuclei, and that's, that's going to go down by half. So we go down halfway, we draw a straight line across to the graph, and then we draw it down from the graph. Now, you're going to use a ruler and do it neater than me, but you must show you're working with this because there'll be marks for that. So look at the starting count, half it, draw a line to the graph and down to the time. That is your half-life. So let's try again with this one here. Your counts per minute starts off as 80. So we halve that, 40, draw across to the graph, and then we draw down. So here my half-life is two days. Here my half-life is 10 seconds. Notice where I'm getting the days and the seconds from, from the units over here. Okay, now there's another way of looking at half-life, and that's to be able to work out from the starting count rate how the count rate goes down each half-life. So the radioactivity, or the count rate of radioactive rocks, goes down over time. They become less radioactive over time, as the radioactive deca atoms decay into normal atoms. So have a look at this example. Half-life of a material X is two years. So every two years, the number of radioactive atoms goes down by half. Not divided by two, um, not, not, not going down by the same amount each time, but by going down by half each time. So the count rate started at 240 counts per second, it would fall to 120, then 60, then 30, etc. and so on. Okay, irradiation and contamination. So to irradiate means to shine nuclear radiation like a torch. This is useful for sterilising medical equipment or treating cancer. So you can focus it onto some cancerous cells, or we can shine it like a torch at some, um, some equipment that needs to be sterilised. Um, Alpha, beta or gamma radiation can come out in a stream and hit an object. Afterwards, the object is not radioactive anymore. So because it's the alpha and beta and gamma particles themselves that are coming out, they, there is nothing that stays on the, on the materials itself. Um, afterwards, the object is not radioactive, and therefore it's not dangerous, um, as the alpha and beta and gamma will have been absorbed um, or, 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 or released. So that is irradiation. Now, irradiation is different to contamination. To contaminate with radiation means that we have uh, put radioactive atoms and we've attached them to an object. So that there is an actual lump of maybe uranium or plutonium or any other radioactive material that's attached to the object. And that's, that's why we say contaminated. Now, this can be useful sometimes. Um, so it is, it's dangerous because those objects can continue to release alpha, beta and gamma radiation even, you know, unless you remove the contaminating material. So this can be really useful if you want to see inside a human during a medical checkup. So for example, a patient may drink a barium liquid to see inside their stomach. And here we have, there's a spine, here we have their small intestine here, and we can see the travel of this barium liquid through their digestive system. And that might be really helpful to see maybe blockages or, or issues. We can also check for water leaks in a, in a sealed water pipe. So they would seal the ends off of the water pipe to find the leak. They would pump down a radioactive material, and we can call this contamination, uh, to contaminate the water. And they'll be able to use a detector up above the ground to see where the highest amount of radiation is. And they'll notice that it's coming out from where the leak is. With more leak, there's more radioactive material there, so a, a bigger reading there. So both contamination and irradiation can be dangerous in the wrong situation, but also highly useful if it's, if it's got a purpose. And be prepared to explain in detail what it's used for and how they, how they, how they use it.